And welcome to Failure to Launch, the space history podcast where we take you through all the mistakes, failures, and explosions that made modern space exploration possible. We are your hosts, Quinn, Chris, and a radar contact that matches Chris. And this is part two of our series on Project Vanguard, aka Kaputnik. First off, in advance, uh, for any theoretical listeners who were wondering where we were, um, this As episode to has listeners. been. Yeah, <laughs> this this episode has been a long time coming. Uh, Vanguard part one was about a month and a half ago. Do not worry. We are intending to keep uh, get back onto our old schedule. I used the holiday break to get like five scripts ahead. Uh, we're also going to be going back through our YouTube uh, backlog and getting all of those posted soon with uh, some nice visuals. But yeah, how are how are you guys doing this fine? I don't know. Day before I post the episode. How you doing, Mr. Chris? I'd like to hear. You don't oh, get you to know. throw the, the question like that. Yeah, we're just going to throw it to me. Uh, you know, oh, I'm, do I'm worry. recovering I'll take from my back injury. Oh, nice. On um, the up and up. Actually, maybe this, is, maybe this isn't podcast stuff, but I do need to ask you about that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe, maybe a listener is a physiotherapist. You never know. It's, a, it's, it's got a whole story. Offer to It'll be bonus content whenever we make a Patreon. Photo of me, of uh, Chris's lower back. That can be the episode art. Oh, God. Honestly, physiotherapy in space is something we will talk about. And like this, the uh, the brave people who simulate it by staying in bed for months on end and get fired if they so much as sit up. Oh, God. Yeah, awful. it's it's uh, a <laughs> yeah, uh, there there's an entire chapter of a book I really like on it. It's a very uh, interesting topic. So so, yeah, speaking of dumb little space projects. Um, this is our this is part two of our series on Project Vanguard, which was the U.S. Navy's attempt to be the first to put a satellite in orbit. So last time uh, I'll just give a quick rundown because, yeah, it was a month and a half ago. I suppose listeners can listen just like click on the other episode. But uh, uh, so last time we talked about how the U.S. Army, Navy and Air Force, they were they were actually all competing against each other over who would get to own ballistic missiles. Um we talked about how they were all terrified of Engine Charlie, who was President Eisenhower's cost-cutting defense secretary, and how even though they won the competition to be America's satellite launcher, uh, the Navy's Project Vanguard was actually like a pseudo-civilian mess full of rival companies, constant redesigns, and technology that was so groundbreaking and cutting edge, it didn't actually work. The first gimbaled rockets, the for a lot of uh, the first use of hypergolic fuels, uh, advanced solid rocket boosters... Project Vanguard was like a prototype from tip to stem. Nothing was proven. Just throw everything at the wall at once and see what happens. Yeah, yes. and nothing sticks. Spoiler. That's why we're, it's OK. It's not a spoiler. We're talking about it. That means things don't go good. It started going to shit and it has it has proceeded yes. to go even further into the shit. So, yeah, speaking. Yeah. As things go to shit, where we last left off. Uh, it was November of 1957. Sputniks one and two had just launched. The Sputnik panic is in full swing, and the United States government needed a win so badly that they actually leaked the date of Vanguard's next test launch to the press, and like they told everybody, this is going to be America's official answer to Sputnik. And crucially, they did not give the Vanguard team any advance notice of this. I would like to draw a quick comparison. Sure. I love how Sputnik was launched because Korolev and Glushka are just the ultimate used car salesmen. And that also kicked the U.S. government in the crotch, too, because, good Lord, I need a W here, like Brezhnev. This is why, like, if there's going to be any 
inside jokes or like memes of this show. It's the fact that everything stems back to Khrushchev somehow. Like <laughs> Cosmos 954 crashed because the Soviets <laughs> needed a long term satellite to guide their missiles and they needed missiles because Khrushchev slashed the Soviet Navy and trashed their aircraft carriers because he got so rocket pilled by Korolev. Like you can you can draw the line. We can play you can, six degrees. You can draw Khrushchev. the line to the Moskva getting sunk all the way back to Khrushchev just being so sold on rockets that he scrapped rocket -pilled. like normal Soviet actual ships. So we can play six degrees to Khrushchev after exactly. the episode. <laughs> that, that could be a fun thing to end the episode on of like, how do we link this back to Khrushchev? How do we make whatever we're talking about Khrushchev's fault? I love it. And it'll work in more cases than not. Anyway, yeah, the, the Project Vanguard test in question, Test Vehicle 3, like it wasn't even expected to reach orbit. Uh, it had the capacity to, but if it did, they just consider that a bonus. But none of that mattered. The Sputniks had wounded American pride and the government had given the public an answer. Everyone expected Vanguard to like end the Sputnik panic and reestablish America as this like dominant space power. In the words of one Vanguard engineer, TV3 became, quote, the wettest dry run in history. Test vehicle three. So I think we talked about it last time, but Test Vehicle 3 was actually the fourth test launch of the program. Like they started off with a, a, a test called TV-0. It would also be the first test launch where all of the rocket stages were actually meant to work. Before that, they'd sort of like puzzle piece the rocket together with, with each test adding more functionality. Like, for example, TV-0 was literally just the first stage. And then they added stuff on top. TV-3 was going to put it all together. The first stage filled with kerosene and oxygen. The second stage filled with our, you know, favorite thing ever, unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine and white fuming nitric acid. And the third stage made from a new type of experimental solid booster. God, I love it. And if everything worked perfectly, the rocket would put its payload into orbit and narrow the Soviets lead in the space race down to like 2-1. But that is if it worked perfectly. Vanguard's actual planned like first orbital launch was TV4, which was scheduled for March of like 1958, like four months later. But even though TV3 wasn't expected to make it to orbit, they gave it a, a little satellite anyway, just in case. You have to a little. You need, yeah. They had a beepy boy. Just they in case. Sputnik one. And that payload is actually very interesting. So we're going to take a bit of time to talk about it. And that payload was actually pretty interesting. So like Sputnik 1, it was spherical and polished to a chrome sheen. Uh, also like Sputnik 1, it had antennas and didn't do a whole lot more than beep. But Sputnik 1 was two feet across and weighed 180 pounds. The Vanguard satellite was six inches across and weighed in at a whopping three pounds. The <laughs> smallest boy. Yes. Well, wait, so, it had solar panels. Uh, Khrushchev famously called this thing the grapefruit satellite because, you know, it's the size of a grapefruit. You could hold it in your hand. There are pictures of people holding this thing comfortably in their palm. Hey, what's wrong with a compact little boy? I'm going to be fair right now because I'm going to be a lot less fair later on. The actual Vanguard satellite was well engineered for the contest the Americans and the Soviets were competing in. So I, last time we talked about the IGY, the International Geophysical Year, and they basically had a contest to launch a satellite. It didn't need to be big and it didn't need big transmitters like Sputnik 1 had. It also didn't need to carry heavy batteries because it was the first ever satellite to have solar panels and be able to recharge itself. But here's the problem. After Sputnik 1 and 2 launched, no one gave a shit about the IGY or the cool solar panels. Even though he was technically competing in the IGY, Soviet scientist Sergei Korolev was playing by a completely different set of rules. Like he understood the game better. And his satellites were made for that purpose. Propaganda. Here's an example. The IGY wanted satellites to beep in a range of frequencies that could be picked up by like highly sensitive instruments. The transmitters on the satellites did not need to be that strong because the ground based antennas were so sensitive. But Sputnik 1's radio alone weighed more than twice as much as the entire Vanguard satellite. It was also set to beep at a much lower frequency than Vanguard and it pumped out way more energy. While this might seem wasteful and unnecessary, it's actually because Korolev designed the satellite so that anyone with a radio could listen to it. There was also the fact that the Sputniks, especially Sputnik 2, were huge and were launched by what the Soviets were like very clearly calling a ballistic missile. So they were sending a message and the message was clear. The satellites can be swapped out for a nuke anytime Khrushchev wanted. The payload is payload. Exactly. And if anyone wasn't getting that message, like... Khrushchev was going up in front of the UN and telling people the thing that launched my satellite is also a ballistic missile and I will use it. 
So like that is what people are thinking of even in the back of their mind. That's what's in the newspaper whenever people talk about Sputnik 1 and 2. The Vanguard satellite, meanwhile, had basically no value as a propaganda tool. Normal people wouldn't be able to pick up its transmissions. It was launched from a rocket that could never deliver any kind of warhead. It was too specialized. Well, it was also like completely non-military, which was actually a reason it got picked way back when. It's just our little angry space pencil. Like whenever you get down to the messaging, Sputnik threatened the world with nuclear annihilation. The only way Vanguard would be threatening to someone is if you like threw it at their head. I like if you if you held it in if you held it in your hand and bludgeoned someone with it, maybe the Vanguard satellite would be like threatening. I'm pretty sure Andrew Charlie could get a good wind up with it. I like, don't know what World War Three would be fought with, but I know what World War Four will be, and that's with the Vanguard satellite being smashed on the heads of our enemies. Vanguard yeah, it's, it's the it's the rods from God, except it's just a tight. It's a thing about you know the size of a softball. It's a baseball bat with Vanguard on it. And all of that is basically a long way of saying that the first time most Americans got a look at Project Vanguard was when the White House leaked the launch date and the media started reporting on it. And a lot of people immediately noticed that America's answer to Sputnik didn't really it didn't really measure up. However, and I'm starting to feel stupid repeating this through like every single series we've done, the media and politicians saw Vanguard as a way to attack Eisenhower's administration. They decided that all of Vanguard's obvious failings were because the White House had underfunded it and made it a low priority mission. From Red Moon Rising, quote, Engine Charlie Wilson, for his part, was waylaid by TV journalist Mike Wallace. You clearly underestimated the importance of basic research. Why? Wallace demanded. The satellite business wasn't a military matter, Wilson replied evasively. It was in the hands of the scientists. Besides, he airily continued, people are panicking over nothing. They're so cracked loose on Buck Rogers that they're seeing spaceships and flying saucers. But Sputnik 1 and 2 exist, and astonished Wallace fired back. They are not flying saucers. I have a feeling that something does still get lost is that awesome, we can still drop thermonuclear payloads. Does it really matter whether the bomb is delivered faster or not? In any kind of nuclear exchange, congratulations, everyone's going to be reduced to soup. OK, but that's that practicality stuff we talked about, like America, even at this point. Oh, yeah, true. Has all of the bombers. Sensationalism is alive and well. Like the, the reason the Soviets got the rockets was to respond to America having a load of bombers. It was the next step up the ladder. Yeah, but it's not it, but it's more impressive. Bombers aren't impressive compared to spaceships. We're falling behind. They're going to make late. We're going to have guns and they're going to have like death. Beams. I don't know, man. Have you That's ever seen the, a B-52 fly over a NASCAR race? I, I have not. I'm I'm not from a place where NASCAR. That's yeah, where the where the Air Force where any of uh, those things exist. Because I'm pretty sure one of those is better for propaganda flights than the other. The other one means yeah. you're about to get vibe checked if you live in very certain parts of the country. I don't know. My my cousin worked uh, on Canada's tankers for a while. I I could see oh, if he still me. knows people and try and wrangle a flyby. So. Like we were talking about with that Engine Charlie thing, um, they were setting it up. Clearly, the media was setting it up so that if Vanguard failed, which everyone expected it to do, it would be the government's fault. TV3 was scheduled to launch from Cape Canaveral on December 6th, 1957. So this is a month after Sputnik 2 launched. Uh, and the preparation stage was fully fucked. For example, TV2, Vanguard's earlier test launch, had failed to lift off five different times because of malfunctions between August and October. And every part that failed on TV2 had to be ripped out of TV3. That meant that when TV2 launched and it was TV3's turn, it was already a cannibalized wreck and had to be hastily rebuilt with spare parts from a different rocket. Franken rocket. When the launch day finally rolled around, the attitude was that the rocket was basically as ready as it was ever going to get. And even if it wasn't, it was just a test launch and they were ready for it to fail. What the engineers and scientists weren't ready for was a literal crowd of reporters who packed onto nearby Birdwatch Hill to watch. And they did not have to wait for long. At 11 a.m., Vanguard Test Vehicle 3 lifted off. And to describe what happened next, I'm going to quote from Red Moon Rising. Quote, the roar of the engines increased to a piercing shriek, and the last of the umbilical cords dropped away. The rocket shuddered and strained against its moorings. It was moving. It was up. Only a few feet, but it was gaining strength. And then Vanguard quivered, burst into flames, and languidly crumpled onto the launch pad, setting off a blast wave felt for miles. So, <laughs> yeah, you guys saw the video. Like, it the rocket fully folds in half 
as it crumples. Like <laughs> it almost seems like one of those one of the umbilicals was actually providing almost like a bungee cord effect, just pulling some weight off a rocket. Then when it finally disconnects, it just drops. <laughs> and you would think that, you know, it's actively shedding weight, too. Yeah, but the first thing to shed weight is the first stage coming which off is the, the thing providing the lift and it yeah and i might be overthinking it but i think in that video you can see like this, there's a secondary explosion i think that's when the second and third stage dropped into the first stage's fireball very quickly i'm gonna john madden this i'm just gonna go to half speed no yeah you can actually see over the course over the course of like 10 seconds you can see the flaring of when each stage detonates oh no back up how many stages are there on this three three so the initial explosion there's a second bright flash of the second explosion and then there's yeah. a third explosion no i think the first explosion and the uh flame fireball are the same stage because usually what happens is that solid fuel doesn't explode it just burns very vigorously well, i mean challenger listen that was just very vigorous burning i'm sorry but yeah absolutely you can you can chronicle when oh look they lost containment on the second stage and there's the first we need to do okay that's that's gonna be the next thing anytime there's a crash we do like a john madden like t taking it apart and just like oh yep yep see that's going off to the left that shouldn't do that that should stay with the rocket just circle the, just circle <laughs> the rocket now you see the first stage is tilted this is wrong. But then, as all the reporters were watching the rocket burn on the launch pad, something miraculous happened. Their radios started picking up a faint beeping sound. Oh no. The boy. He's trying to live! He's That's trying right. to live! It survived. So, the explosion actually knocked Vanguard's nose cone clean off and threw Grapefruit 1 to safety in a nearby swamp. <laughs> something had to have happened because it wasn't transmitting on launch. So something got it had, I think it had a timer. Oh, a timer. But like, yeah, after a bit, it starts beeping out its victorious mission accomplished. We did it. Any <laughs> crash you can walk away from is a victory. Unfortunately, even though it survived the blast, it did not survive the angry reporters who tracked it down and killed it. No! You can go and see the satellite at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, and they basically broke it in half. Here's they a picture. They killed it. No, <laughs> he survives catastrophe to be canceled by the media. Getting curb stomped by someone from like the Miami Herald. <laughs> he didn't even deserve to be canceled. He was to be our bright <laughs> beepy boy. TV3 Aftermath. To put it simply, Vanguard immediately became the laughing stock of the entire world. I'm going to give you a selection of what the media called it. Lopnik, Splatnik, Stalnik, Sputternik, Dudnik, Puffnik, Oopsnik, Goofnik, and my personal favorite, Kaputnik. I, okay, first of all, Splatnik doesn't count because he was murdered. I, I might be mispronouncing this, but German newspapers called it Spitnik, which means Leitnik, while the French media suggested that Vanguard be renamed to Rearguard. That's good. <laughs> you see why some of these media dudes have jobs. In America, the media declared it our worst humiliation since Custer's last stand. And despite the fact that Vanguard had been put in this situation by the government and that TV3 was only meant to be a test flight, they got no backup. In fact, one of the first things the Pentagon did was put on a press briefing distancing themselves from Vanguard. Quote, This incident has no bearings on... Uh, this incident has no bearing on our programs from the development of intermediate range and intercontinental ballistic missiles, which are continuing to make fine progress. So they get fully hung out to dry. Oh, there would be there is spite. There is so <laughs> like, much fucking spite. Yeah. And like the government is lucky social media doesn't exist at this point, because like all it would take is one of these engineers just like spewing off like a huge post somewhere to just... just the i don't care i already found another job i'm going to burn this house down okay funny you should mention that. no so we'll, we'll get to that the government also tried to distance itself from vanguard but they weren't really as successful like we talked about everyone knew that if tv3 went wrong it'd be eisenhower's fault and this was all coming at a particularly bad time for ike because about a week before vanguard launched uh, the president had a massive stroke. He survived and recovered, but basically just in time to be thrown into another political nightmare. The media and opposition politicians had a goddamn field day, laying out every way that Ike had left America defenseless and let the Soviets like take this big scientific lead. 
politics as usual, it seems. Oh, yeah. And it gets worse. As if this wasn't bad enough, his allies also started to abandon and even attack him. Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, uh, the brother of the head of the CIA, another, yeah, like (laughs) fucking chief ghoul, one of the two Dulles brothers, ranted about the stupidity of announcing launch days in advance instead of keeping them secret like the Soviets did. I wonder who did that. Jim Haggerty, the press secretary who had started all this by leaking Vanguard's launch day, was nowhere to be found. Even Ike's vice president, a little guy you might have heard of called Richard Nixon, used the incident to distance himself as much as possible from his boss. This is partly because the two men had never really gotten along and Ike excluded Nixon from his inner circle, but mostly because Nixon had dreams of becoming president one day and he was determined not to let Vanguard ruin his political career. Like he was not going to go down with Eisenhower. My blood pressure is going up. He's an opportunist. There, there's actually a good joke from that period that I read that was basically like that kind of sums up the attitude between Eisenhower and Nixon. It basically goes like a UFO lands on the White House lawn. Aliens come out and approach Nixon and they say like they point a gun at him and say like, take me to your leader. And he goes, I can't. I hardly know the guy. <laughs> uh, yeah, sounds all right. Fuck him. Meanwhile, a different opportunist was also using Vanguard to get closer to the presidency. So in the earlier Sputnik episodes, we talked about how LBJ quickly set himself up as like the main Democrat critic when it came to satellites and missiles. Uh, When the big scare about the bomber gap was actually getting started, it was a different dude called Stuart Symington leading the charge. But LBJ basically cooed him and took over just by being the loudest mouth in the room. With the largest rocket in the room. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Jumbo. And Vanguard was basically catnip to him. So he quickly set up what he called preparedness hearings. On paper, these were like meetings of experts and politicians to figure out exactly what went wrong and what needed to change. In practice, they were LBJ's personal way to amplify himself, shouting, quote, How long, how long, oh God, will it take us to catch up to the Soviet Union's two satellites? (laughs) That is a literal quote. I am not being melodramatic. Beautiful. Oh, yeah, like he's he's full on doing like fire and brimstone preacher shit. (laughs) Oh, loud. <laughs> loud. Oh, we God. Need satellites. Oh, watch out. They are very good at missing a major city and I don't know, microwaving a farm somewhere. Now, the upshot of all this was a massive amount of pressure on Project Vanguard and the people heading it up from Red Moon Rising. Quote, already the Glenn L. Martin company, Vanguard's general contractor, had been punished. Its stock had taken such a beating that it had been forced to suspend trading. Vanguard's project manager, the affable John Hagen, had been equally assailed at a raucous press conference. This program has had unprecedented publicity in the development stage, which is not usually the case, he said as he tried to defend himself. The fact that it was a test phase was lost sight of, he added, deflecting culpability from his scientists to politicians whom he refused to name. And here's the best part. All of this pressure and harassment wasn't limited to just the leadership, and it didn't come just from the media and politicians. From Vanguard, a history, quote, A few weeks after the event, Mr. Mark Harrion, an engineer working at Martin, encountered trouble in getting a painter to do some work at his Baltimore home. Finally, the engineer would later recall, one of the men I approached had the courtesy to level with me. To tell you the truth, Mr. Mark Harrion, I don't feel much like working for anyone connected with Project Vanguard. God, so getting these, so these dudes are getting just like harassed in their day to day. It's like people are just refusing to work with them. <laughs> this sucks, man. Yeah. Imagine getting dropped into this, just going to work one day, and then, wow, why are all these reporters here? And then oh, no. and then everyone in the world is suddenly like, why did you kill America? Why did you do it? Every single reactionary pundit is screaming for your head at oh, once. Oh, dude. <laughs> I, I know we said, I'm glad the government, like, the, the government should be glad social media didn't exist, but, like, these dudes would be getting death threats today. Oh, 100%. Now, just because they had failed on the world stage and embarrassed their entire country, that did not mean the Project Vanguard was down for the count. Despite the media witch hunt and the politicians who put them in this situation suddenly getting cold feet, the scientists and engineers continued to work on a new emergency launch. You know what? Good on them. Yeah, they they made the most of it. This is literally spite launching. This is, okay, you know what? Fine, we'll do it ourselves. And you kind of can tell it's an emergency launch because of the name. Test Vehicle Backup 3, or TV-3BU, was appropriately enough the backup rocket for the earlier flight, and they planned on launching it in January of 1958, so like a month away, and then they would have Test Vehicle 4 in like March of 1958. Oh, okay. 
And yeah, like despite all the issues, they're pretty much on track for this. But this is where we get a new hero in our story. The U.S. Army. Wait a second. And that is not a thing I will say very often in like any context. I was just (laughs) saying, wait a second. How many times has this been said? Yeah. Just in general in history, this is the oh thank God it's a Catholic church. Oh, I mean God, like maybe part church. like parts of World War II, maybe. I was about to ask if this is like a here comes our new hero or here comes our new hero, you know? It's kind of the second. It's one where like they're gonna fuck shit up for our actual heroes, but I respect them for doing it. So do you remember how in part one of our series uh, the army lost the ballistic missile and satellite contest, and they were actually ordered not to develop any missile with a range of over 200 miles, right? They were doing it anyway, weren't they? Of course, they didn't stop. Uh, they kept their program running in secret. <laughs> many, many, many $50 toilet paper rolls later on the budget. <laughs> now, listener, you may be thinking that the obvious culprit here is Werner von Braun, the Nazi V2 scientist who, like many others, had been brought to the U.S. to help their space program. After all, like most of these scientists wound up in the Army Ballistic Missile Agency, ABMA, and Von Braun was legendary for basically doing anything that would bring him closer to his like rocket dreams. And this is something we will definitely be talking about in later episodes, because that legendary willingness to do anything goes to some incredibly dark and horrible places. But it actually wasn't Von Braun that came up with the scheme. Uh, When the Pentagon shut down the Army rocket program, Von Braun and his team were actually ready to pack up and like head off to private industry. Von Braun himself was actually ready to like his brother already had a job in private industry and he was trying to convince Werner to come with him. The man, the legend, who decided to run an entire military missile program in secret, like he was a goddamn Bond villain, is probably the greatest unsung hero in space history, Brigadier General John Bruce Metaris. I know no one, like you guys and the listeners, don't know who Metaris is, but I'm convinced he deserves an air horn. So he's going to get one. I think we'll learn over the course of the next many minutes, we will learn to appreciate him. Basically like if Tony Stark was in the military is the best way to describe it. Oh, God. We'll definitely be taking the time to talk about JBM in more detail. But for now, just understand that he is a maverick. He is a Chad. He is definitely not that interested in this whole order following thing. From Red Moon Rising, quote, It wasn't that Metaris didn't respect rules, but like Douglas MacArthur and Patton, he simply didn't think they applied to him, as the Huntsville military police had discovered a few weeks earlier when he roared into his new command in a Jaguar and dressed in golf attire. Didn't you see the speed limit sign back there? The startled MPs had demanded. What did it say? 45 miles an hour and you were going 60, sir. Son, I'm General Metaris and the speed limit is now 60. Uh, what yeah, a that's, guy. <laughs> that's him. He just kind of like changes rules to whatever the, whatever he wants and he's always in like a sports car the man exists with glowing eyes during world war ii he was like a supply officer and at some point between world war ii and this he found god and became a baptist preacher oh which <laughs> the people who worked with him basically described it as like yeah it didn't change his attitude at all it just meant that like his his screaming rants became less angry and more Biblical. angry slash holy beautiful Yeah, I was going to say I was just waiting for, you know, huh? he found God because he worked in logistics and found how (laughs) fuck everything usually is. When Vanguard was picked as the main U.S. satellite launcher, Metaris took one look at it, saw all the flaws and made a pretty risky gamble. He decided to keep the Army's rocket program going in secret, betting that Vanguard would fail and that he would be able to swoop in and save the day. Basically, this is a better to ask for forgiveness than permission kind of situation. I feel that. That's the the ethos that my old programmer at my old job worked by. Um, So the whole time Vanguard was fumbling their way through development, Werner von Braun and the other Operation Paperclip scientists were working on their own rocket and running secret test launches. I need to be clear, they were not allowed to do this. They had been barred from making long-range rockets, and the way they got around any suspicion was actually pretty awesome. They just renamed their rockets and lied about what they would be testing. (laughs) Their original rocket to launch a satellite was called Jupiter. Do you want to guess what their new rocket was called? Saturn. Jupiter C. Jupiter C? Yes. The C stands for completely different. I I don't know. It's Jupiter C. It's different now. (laughs) That's army enough to just be army. Uh, According to the army, the Jupiter C test rocket was completely in line with the Pentagon's orders because it it was meant to be a heat shield test bed. That is... 
in order to develop new heat shields to protect missile warheads, they needed a rocket that could get a heavy payload into space and moving at orbital speeds. And this was all they said this was all just a way to make heat shields tests realistic. And as stupid as this sounds, it sort of worked. <laughs> I say sort of because some officials at the Pentagon did get a little suspicious, but they never never suspicious enough that they actually like cracked down on him. Here's how good this got. As early as September 1956, more than a year before Sputnik 1 launched, an Army Jupiter C carried a 30 pound dummy satellite to an altitude of 1100 kilometers and a speed of 7 kilometers per second. For context, the speed required to make an orbit at that altitude is 7.3 kilometers per second. And if they had aimed for a lower altitude, like 400 kilometers, they could have easily put that satellite into orbit. Like, Werner von Braun came alarmingly close to launching the world's first satellite illegally. <laughs> oh, that would have been beautiful. And here's the best part. The only reason the satellite didn't reach orbit is because its last stage was a dud. So, like, remember how I said some Pentagon officials had gotten a little suspicious, but not enough to shut it down? They basically relied on it getting to a certain point in second stage and going, yes, we know the specific impulse of this rocket. We know we that know it could be happen. able to. Yeah, they, d they didn't want to use the dummy stages. The people at the Pentagon went to Met Metaris and said, basically, we know what you're trying to do. Don't do it. I want you to personally inspect the last stage of every rocket and make sure it was filled with sand to prevent Von Braun from orbiting a satellite, quote from the officials, by accident. They know exactly what they were doing. <laughs> but the army wasn't the one who was allowed to do it. So they didn't get to do it. It's too good. Just I want you to physically make sure because this shifty fuck is going to try something. Especially when the shifty fuck wasn't Von Braun. It was Metaris. It's one thing to launch a rocket and say it's for something else. It's another when like Metaris is given a direct order. He can't get around that. Yeah. Like if they tell you. All right. All right. Fine. We just add another stage to the bottom of the rocket. Exactly. The fourth stage is like a little, they say the fourth stage is like a little pop rocket hooked to the side. See, it's full of sand. Look. Okay. After the TV3 explosion and while Vanguard was getting torn to shreds by the media and politicians, the army decided to reveal their little scheme. Like, have you guys ever seen the allow us to introduce ourselves meme? Yes. Oh, no. The entire Pentagon crew is just rubbing their eyes going, <sighs> God fucking damn it. God damn Metaris. <laughs> Not these guys again. So they went to the new defense secretary, Neil McElroy, and they offered him two Jupiter C rockets that they just happened to have sitting around that they could, quote unquote, modify for satellite launches. Uh, since these were totally not satellite launching vehicles, these were heat shield test vehicles. Come on, they're different. With heat shield ballast. test vehicles that were also <laughs> transporting sand. Yes. Conveniently. Hey, the shape of a satellite. <laughs> Sand is a very and, good heat resistive material and it will not suffer any degradation upon high exposure. Doing this was a huge risk. They had no idea how McElroy would react to, again, a general and a handful of scientists telling him they had misplaced tens of millions of dollars worth of military hardware. And they were like, remember, when I say they were offering two of these rockets back to him, they were ransoming two of these rockets to him. And they were saying, these, like, man, we have them in a warehouse. We're not going to use them unless you give unless you let us do this. And once upon a time, one of these men happened to wear a suspiciously colored armband. Yes. <laughs> well, to a lot of them, all of them. In fact, I don't think Metaris, Metaris wore an armband. Yes. <laughs> but Metaris gambled that they'd get away with it. And he was mostly right. After the Sputnik panic and the embarrassment of Vanguard, the government desperately needed a win. But that doesn't mean he got away with it scot free. Metaris would have to answer for, his, again, his literal crimes, and while the army got their chance, they didn't get exactly what they were hoping for. They would get their launch after Vanguard. The next Vanguard launch, the one we talked about, um, Test Vehicle 3 Backup, TV3BU, was scheduled for January of 1958, and it only had a launch window of a few days. The army's Jupiter C was scheduled for the launch window immediately after on the launch pad literally next door. We we are racing to this is the space race. It is two rockets within a mile of each other racing to launch first. I must also say, I love how we have managed to also kind of get into the Russian naming scheme of the US. Ah, oh, yes, here is our <laughs> TV3 BU. Oh, you're, you're just like T72 BE3 F12. Yeah. Oh, 
not Nick, yes. Yeah, like, like this ultimately comes down to these two guys, these two teams are literally going to race against each other. For Project Vanguard, what this meant is they had less than two months to get their broken down rocket ready and launched. And if they didn't, they might lose their chance permanently. The army, meanwhile, set up on their launch pad, got comfortable, and waited. The Army Navy Race. Okay, so here's how this race worked. Normally, we I wouldn't want to get this granular, but I want you guys to keep track of the days because all of these events happened like very quickly. These they are shotgunning objectives. The Vanguard crew was set up at launch pad 18A and the army was set up at launch pad 26A. These launch pads are about half a mile apart or 800 meters. They can see each other easily and both teams had people whose sole job was to spy on the other launch pad with binoculars. That is how close these guys are. This is how much of a photo finish America's first satellite is. Imagine having a fucking PhD in aeronautics and your job is <laughs> dipshit, take these binoculars, get up there. They do anything weird, let us know. You're just looking at you're looking at the other team and they all, all have binoculars. They are smoking constantly. You're smoking constantly. You're, you just have binoculars in one hand, then a combination of holding a cigarette and a middle finger up in the other. <laughs> uh, yeah, like their, their rocket is painted with a giant middle finger pointed at you. Vanguard still had the first launch window, and this would be between Thursday, January 23rd and Sunday, January 26th. Keep track of those days. If they didn't launch during that time, the army would get the next slot. So I'll go day by day to give you an idea of like how this goes. And I want you to like really try and put yourself in their shoes. If you've ever worked late on a project a day before like the due date, this is like that, but way worse. This is like working on a project right before the deadline, except that you have the entire country watching over your shoulder. These guys are already tired and angry. They've been working on this for months. They've been hounded by the media. The politicians who put them in this situation are now blaming them. Their houses are unpainted. It's like nothing is going good. <laughs> The definition of a motherfucker, I will have my house painted just exactly. so you watch. If it is the last thing I do. So Wednesday, the day before the first launch, it's pouring outside the whole time. It is getting in all of the equipment. Oh, so Thursday, the first available launch day. The plan is to launch in the morning, right at the start of the launch window. And then four and a half minutes before launch, rainwater gets in the electronics and causes a short circuit. So they pushed the launch back to 4 p.m. that evening, but more glitches forced them to push to 7 p.m. And then, nine minutes before launch, cloud cover rolls in. They wait for an hour and a half, but the launch gets scrubbed for safety reasons. In one day, they had three failed launch attempts. Three. We're at the end of Thursday. They still had a big decision to make because their rocket was still loaded with horrible fuels and freezing cold liquid oxygen. If they left it too long, there was the risk that it'd corrode or freeze parts of the rocket, but draining it would mean working through the night. So guess which they picked? Send it. Absolutely, send it. They left it in. And in slight fairness to them, I also would not want to work on nitric acid while tired. That's a definition for my face is going to melt, I'm going to burn. They might have the boots left at the end of this. Man. Hold that thought. This sucks. Oh, no. <laughs> and I, I, I can tell it's going to continue to get worse. Yeah, because we still have we still have three days to go. And then we get to Friday, the second day of the launch window. Things are looking up. The weather is nice. There's not a cloud in the sky. And then just 22 seconds before liftoff, uh, the rocket's umbilical gets stuck. So these are the fuel and electrical cables that are supposed to like disconnect automatically just before launch. Instead, with the rocket very primed for launch, a dude is sent out on a cherry picker to disconnect them by hand. <laughs> like we are talking about a hypergolic cartridge is about to burst in a turbine and they send some dude up in cherry picker to whack it with a hammer until it gives up the <laughs> ghost. Yes. Oh, no. So he goes up there. He disconnects the umbilicals. They set the launch back another three hours. This time they get 14 seconds before launch when an alarm starts screaming. It turned out that all of the liquid oxygen they'd left in the tanks had frozen a bunch of the fuel valves open, meaning that they have to drain it and refill it, which takes the rest of the day. Critically, they only drain the first stage, not the hypergolic second stage. Oh, because that's going to go just swimmingly. Saturday rolls around and it has even more problems and glitches. When the last launch attempt fails at 11 p.m., they decide to try for Sunday. Now remember, Sunday is the last day in their launch window. If they don't get the launch then, like if they don't launch, 
they lose their turn and the army gets to launch. So they are determined to get this done. Like it is now or never for them. (laughs) And to explain what happens next, I'm going to quote from Red Moon Rising. Quote, the three hour countdown was slated to start at 1 p.m. And Vanguard technicians in hard hats and gray coveralls were giving TV3BU a final once over when a human shriek followed by an ear piercing siren erupted from launch pad 18A. A worker was screaming in agony, holding his face. Brown fumes, the sign of an acid leak, were rising from the middle of the rocket. Firefighters were dispatched to douse the leak while senior engineers ran to assess the damage. It was serious. Acid had burned its way into one of the motors. The entire second stage engine would have to be replaced. Also, a dude's face melted off. I mean, I knew I knew that this is a matter of time. They're working like 18 hour days and just three days straight of this. They are chain smoking right next to all of the rocket fuel. Like they are hitting it with hammers. Who well, is this white fuming nitric acid? Yeah, w- uh, white fuming nitric acid is what leaked onto that dude's face. Because, of course, that's something you should mess around with immediately before this. There's nothing wrong that could happen. Based off of what I've read, I do not believe the worker was doing anything wrong. The reason there was a leak was because the acid had leaked its way out of the tanks and was like in, and was in a place it was not meant to be. This was not a the worker did something wrong. This is a you're working with nitric acid. Weird things are going to happen if you take too long. <laughs> So, yeah, like not not like a dude's face has melted off. Uh, They are on their last day of the launch and the entire second stage would have to be replaced. They're asking the dude whose face, you know, vaguely resembles a lasagna. Hey, can you still come in for work? So after going over the damage, it was clear to Vanguard engineers that they had no choice but to scrub the launch. There wasn't enough time to make repairs and they didn't even have enough spare parts to try. The Navy's launch window passed by and the Army got their turn. On February 1st, 1958, Explorer 1 rode an Army Jupiter C rocket into for, into orbit, becoming America's first real answer to the Sputniks. Vanguard's legacy. In the end, the Navy would try to relaunch TV3BU like a few days after Explorer 1. Like they got the basically the way it worked is that both of them had alternating launch windows. Vanguard had the one right after the Army. The rocket took off well, but broke up and exploded a minute into the flight. It would eventually fall to Test Vehicle 4, launching a month later to put the Vanguard 1 satellite into orbit. It is actually still up there today. Although it stopped working decades ago, Vanguard 1 is the oldest satellite in orbit. The Vanguard rocket, meanwhile, would go on to fly another eight times, although only two of them were successful. Its last launch in September of 1958 put the 50-pound Vanguard 3 satellite into orbit. So even though it was a historic shit show of mismanagement, office politics, and and dreaming way too big, Vanguard also pushed the boundaries of rocketry and gave us technologies that are almost universal these days. Things like gimbaled rockets, hypergolic fuels, and solar panels on satellites, these all started with Vanguard. Parts of the rocket, like Aerojet's acid-filled second stage and the X-248 solid booster, would be used in launch vehicles until 2018. Wait, really? Yes. Oh, yeah. shit. In modified versions, but essentially, like, they trace their lineage there. That's actually pretty amazing. When the program was eventually shut down, most Vanguard personnel found their way to a fresh new organization called NASA, where they learned to cooperate instead of compete with the veterans of the other military rocket programs. So you can see why I'd want to talk about this one, both for good and bad things. Like, there is a lot of space history here, and it's a shame that, that projects like this aren't more well known, basically. And that's the thing, it it includes that wonderful blend of, wow, look at all this rivalry, and, huh, they're on the same team. Which, in fairness, like the Soviet Union, they do this all the time. Like, the entire Soviet space program is just different OKBs, is what they're called, uh, different development bureaus competing with each other. But before we cap off the episode, I want to take a little while to talk about how Vanguard got picked to be the first US launch vehicle. I mean... The government was not blind. They knew the Project Vanguard was in trouble with, you know, redesigns and ballooning costs, but they picked it anyway. And while I'm sure there are hundreds of reasons out there, I'm going to argue it comes down to two main factors. First one we're going to talk about is plain old corruption. I think you mean lobbying. That too. Do you remember last episode whenever we talked about the Stewart Committee? <clears throat> like this was the government committee whose job was to pick the best satellite project. It sounds like there are air quotes in that statement, but I, I do vaguely remember. Because this was a committee made up of government defense experts, it meant that almost every one of them either worked for or used to work for a defense company. And Project Vanguard was specifically designed to spread as much money around as many companies as possible. 
that that has never gone wrong in the history of any kind of manufacturing program. And from Red Moon Rising, quote, the fact that some members of the Stewart Committee simultaneously drew paychecks from the aerospace companies bidding on the Vanguard contract had also apparently been overlooked. Committee Chairman Homer Joe Stewart, for instance, was a paid consultant for the Aerojet General Corporation, which hoped to manufacture Vanguard's second stage. Senior panel member Richard Porter worked for General Electric, which was building the, quote, almost ready main engine, while Secretary Quarles' former company, Bell Labs, was a major subcontractor for the rocket's upper stages. So, like, this is why projects like the F-35 and the Space Launch System are so hard to kill, like, and how they can be massive shit shows from start to finish and still have the momentum and the pull to keep going, like, no matter how much their budgets explode or they go over schedule. It's because they spread the work so wide that everyone, every executive and politician has something to gain if the project works and something to lose if it fails. Like, this is what too big to fail means. Project Vanguard definitely wasn't the first example of this, but I think it's one of the clearest. By spreading the work out over dozens of defense contractors, Vanguard gave every reason why they should be picked except anything actually about their rocket. <laughs> they basically said, uh, pick us because we'll create jobs, pick us because we'll encourage R&D, or if all else failed, pick us because we'll hire your company. Which I hate, but I hate the players, I don't hate the game because I understand what they're doing. Yeah. So. The Army, Metaris, and Von Braun didn't have that advantage. All they had was an effective, cheap product that worked. It was made from tested parts, and by the time of the committee's choice, it was already launching payloads at near-orbital velocity. But while you or I might look at that as a good thing, in front of a panel of industry executives, they're all bad. If it's cheap, there's no money to go to industry. If it's already working, then the project will be done quickly, and that means less time for lucrative contracts. If it's built by the army in-house, then there's nothing for committee members or their companies to care about. To attack costs on, too. Exactly. I believe, and I, I want to make it clear that I am not an expert, I believe Vanguard won in part because the committee could see how complicated and troubled it was. If they'd seen what an embarrassment it would have become, maybe they'd have changed their mind. But Vanguard had enough obvious problems back then. I'm sorry, yeah. but I have to contradict you there. They never would have accepted. They just would have dug in their heels and just poured more money into it. And have, a, you know, stoke public fear of sunk cost. Oh, no, not just sunk cost, but just stoke public fear of the Russians can do this, but we can't owe the humanity. The second big factor that led the Stewart Committee to pick Vanguard over the Army's Jupiter C was Werner von Braun. The ex-Nazi scientist picked to lead an entire team of ex-Nazi scientists. Because Operation Paperclip, the plan to steal all those rocket scientists, was an army operation, most of them wound up working for the army at ABMA. Project Vanguard, meanwhile, was mostly made up of American engineers and scientists. What few foreigners it did have, like Kurt Stelling, head of Vanguard's propulsion group, actually fled Europe during World War II. Now, this would be a big cause of tension between the military teams themselves, but there's also a good case to be made that it influenced members of the Stewart Committee. From Red Moon Rising, quote, as fate would have it, the first American to debrief Von Braun after the war was Richard Porter, the GE executive and future member of the Stewart Committee, who was then on loan to Army Ordnance due to his technical background. At that meeting in Germany, Von Braun presented a 20-page memorandum spelling out his potential value to the U.S. military and apparently left a lasting negative impression on Porter. Something about the way Von Braun seamlessly staged his own defection before the fighting had even ended, or perhaps the images of the corpses and skeletal slave laborers found at the young rocket chief's subterranean V2 factory. Like, all of that must have rubbed Porter the wrong way. You don't say. Von Braun's biographer, Eric Burghaust, makes the point that Porter was actually instrumental in scuttling the Army's satellite bid in favor of Vanguard. Homer Joe Stewart himself would later confess that some members of his commission might have been, quote, prejudiced, as the media alleged, but not, he would add, for commercial reasons. There could have simply been an unspoken sentiment that American scientists, rather than a group of ex-Nazis, should lead the country into the dawn of a new era. And that is where I think we can cap off our two-part series on Project Vanguard, America's failed answer to Sputnik. How do you guys feel? The problem is uh, it made so many advances, but at the same time, yeah, it didn't go where it should have programmed. Wise. It's been an emotional roller coaster. Yeah, because especially oh. at the end for me, because like on the one hand, like oh, their their decision to say fuck Nazis actually held back the American space program. I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> I'm actually okay with that because we'll 
we did say that at the same time. Having the, you know, feather in the cap of saying, yes, do you like gimbaled propulsion for your rockets? Would you prefer yeah. that every modern launch system use vernier thrusters? Cool. Thank Vanguard. Yeah, like there, there is a definite, you can trace so much stuff. But the failures of the project Vanguard. mount off repeatedly due to this. But at the same time, just still fuck them. Yeah. And I, I don't I don't want to say it's a happy ending. But yeah, like like we talked about, a lot of these dudes working for the Na- working for Project Vanguard wind up working for NASA and NASA kind of like cobbles together the Army, the Navy and the Air Force rocket scientists like it inherits all of them. And that's not to say everything goes perfectly, because, yeah, like there was a big rivalry between ABMA and Project Vanguard just for the fact that, like, one of them is full of Nazis and the other one is full of Jewish scientists who fled the Nazis. A lot of them did not get along. Thank you for listening to Failure to Launch. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a review or tell a friend. Everything helps. If you want to follow us, contact us or suggest a topic, you can email us at launchfailurepodcast at gmail.com. We're also on Twitter at launch underscore failure. Failure to Launch is hosted on Anchor and we post on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. We also post our episodes with visual aids on YouTube at Failure to Launch. All music was provided by DJ Danarchy.